Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Happy Thursday. So glad everyone enjoyed talking my conversation about gun control in Taiwan. We're doing another responsive uh, discussion episode. We're definitely talking about the San Francisco DA recall. So we'll have lots to talk about the topic. If you have any thoughts you'd like us to go over, definitely send us an email at realignmentpod at gmail.com. Secondly, once again, we're doing those expanded episodes and these three-day week bits because we have people who supported the show. It's been so helpful. So if you've not done so already, definitely go and check our website, realignment.supercast.com, or click on the link at the top of the show notes to give us a support. $5 a month, $50 a year, $500 for a lifetime membership. We recognize that you know it, there's a lot of, uh, let's just say, not great economic times going on here. So if you can't afford it, that's why we've increased this content, haven't just thrown a paywall in front of it. So if you are someone who can stick it, would really appreciate the support. Now on to today's episode of Speaking of David Gillies of the New York Times. He's written a new book. It's really interesting. It's called The Man Who Broke Capitalism, How Jack Welch Got at the Heartland and Crushed the Soul of Corporate America and How to Undo His Legacy. This book is so interesting because it seems like a really bold claim. You know, David talks about this. How can you claim that one specific person broke basically anything. But he's making this argument because he could really say that you could look at the period before Jack Welch became CEO of GE in 1981 and the period after when it comes to wages, trade, unionization, shareholderism, taxes, all these different things really shifted. And he embodies so much of that shift, both as his performance as a CEO, but frankly, the ideas that he propagated across decades of business management. This is also a period of time where there's a lot of debates about the corporation itself and how CEOs should perform, whether celebrity CEOs are a good or a bad thing. So lots of really great things there. So once again, hope you all enjoy this episode and a huge thank you to Lincoln Never for supporting our work. Here's the show. David Gellis, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. Let's ask a slightly meta question that I'm sure your agent at the book level was thought about. Why are there all of these books about Jack Welch and GE these days? There's a book that came out in 2020. There's yours, The Man Who Broke Capitalism. And then William B. Cohen has a book coming out, I think in early 2023. Why are we in the GE moment right now? GE and the Welch years represented and personified the era of capitalism that got us to where we are. And we're in a moment of broad reckoning and reassessment about what works in our economy and critically what doesn't. And to understand how we got here and to understand where we might go, we need to really look clearly at the forces, the institutions, and the individuals that created the world we live in. And in the business world, in the story of American capitalism, that means taking a real close look at GE, Jack Welch, and his protégés more than I would argue any other company, executive, and set of protégés. This is the story that explains how we got here. You know, it's it's funny. I just turned 30, which means that it doesn't mean that I'm old, but it means that because our listenership skews younger, I have certain images when it comes to this type of conversation, but a lot of listeners are do. So I would love for you just to really talk about GE and Jack Welch, because once again, if you're growing up in the aughts, like I did, you would notice that, you know, in my, I was rewatching The Office lately, and Michael Scott's his bookshelf, he has a Jack Welch book. Um, you know, 30 Rock, uh, one of my favorite television shows, like Jack Welch has a couple cameos. The company until, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, the Shinehard Wig Company, which is the, the company which owns uh, um, 30 Rock. It's actually owned by GE before it's eventually sh- sold to Cable Town, which is a stand-in for Comcast. So it was just so present in the 2000s. I'm pretty sure we had a GE laundry machine, but now just totally absent. So really just like explain to folks who missed those 80s, 90s, 2000s heyday, probably that peak in the late 2000s, or I would say the peak is probably in like 2012 when, you know, um, what was the, the, the most recent CEO became like joined the Obama administration. Just really tell that story for folks. I would argue that the story begins much before that. GE from a hundred years ago, even more than that, was 
regarded as one of the most influential companies in this country from the time that Thomas Edison started producing electric light bulbs. It was his company that became GE. So when you think about the introduction of electricity in the United States, when you think about the introduction of everyday appliances like the toaster, the refrigerator, the washing machine, this was GE in the late 19th and early 20th century, the X-ray machines, the first lasers. When the United States helped win World War II, it was GE that set the scientists and started providing some of the jet engines that were going on, some of the first jet aircraft in the middle of the 20th century. When America landed its men on the moon, it was GE engineers sitting next to NASA scientists in Houston, making sure that that space capsule was pointed in the right direction. And then, yeah, absolutely. By the 80s, by the 90s, GE, largely under Jack, had expanded into every manner of business. It was making tons of appliances. Its jet engines were on the wings of just about every Boeing aircraft flying around this country. And it was making still the, not just the electric light bulbs, but the power plants. And then under Jack Welch, it expanded into media, expanded into finance to the tune where it was owning NBC. It was owning investment banks on Wall Street. And it really became this ubiquitous American company that ultimately became, as Jack designed, the largest company, the most valuable company on earth. So even though it's largely faded from memory, it's heyday and this generation of younger workers, it's impossible to overstate the influence this company has had on the story of American economy. So then who was Jack Welch? Jack Welch was the CEO who ran this most important company for the two pivotal decades at the end of the 20th century, from 1981 to 2001. These years when I argue the axis of American capitalism sort of shifted and we moved from the post-war years, the what some people would call the golden age of capitalism. We, we can discuss just how golden it was, but it was an era when companies were sharing their profits broadly with workers with the communities, even with the government, they were proud to pay their taxes. And he ushered in Jack single-handedly by taking over GE and radically reshaping its priorities, ushered in this new cutthroat era of American capitalism that we're still living in today. And we can talk in depth about his backstory, exactly how he did it, but he was the guy that ran the most important company at the most pivotal years when the economy changed and everyone went along for the ride. You know, the way I think you explicitly put it in the book, which is that we should understand Jack Welch's rise to the top of GE, 1981, is there was before Jack Welch and there was after Jack Welch when it comes to capitalism and companies. I think what I would want to push you on mm -hmm. is this idea, how natural was that pre-Jack Welch era? So 1950s, right? And to your point, like, let's, let's just put aside like the very obvious, like, well, like if you were black, could you get access to that? Like, let's just, let's just talk, let's just talk of like your most generic white middle-class high school, but not college educated, um, single household earner living in Michigan. If it's the fifties, this is probably when you're looking at these different factors that you're describing, there's a lot of great things going on for you there, yep. but that state of affairs, you know, like when it comes to unionization, profit sharing that happens when a like most of the world can't compete because it, they yep. the us was the only country that came out of world war ii not only surviving largely untouched but actually stronger than ever um b the soviet union our chief competitor in that period was an economic literal disaster so we didn't even compete with them in the way that we compete with china today so in the 70s you really start to see all of the things I just described really just go away. Competition happens. Japan enters and rebuilds. Germany is a power again. So what I'm basically getting at is there's a world where Jack Welch just never exists. And you have a bunch of leaders of companies who still have those 1950s, 1960s, early 70s values. But no matter what, they're not able to maintain it in the face of global competition. To what degree am I basically just providing excuses for Jack Welch? And to what degree am I actually onto something? There's no doubt that 
around 1981, right when Welch took over, the global economy, the U.S. economy, and GE was poised for dramatic change. All of the factors you just mentioned are 100% right. Stagflation was here as well, by the way. Global competition was on the right. Things were going to change in the U.S. and in GE. But Welch had choices. Mm. And it's important to recognize that we're living in a world shaped by the choices that individual executives make, that shareholders encourage, that policymakers enable. And the choices he made were absolutely extreme. Rather than look for a way to increase GE's competitiveness by doubling down on innovation and research, by upskilling his workers, his first impulse was to institute a series of mass layoffs that destabilized the American working class, that absolutely blew up this notion of employment as something that you could count on in this country. And he proceeded from there to systematically change the way executives were compensated and workers were compensated. And the delta there kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so these were choices, right? America, American companies, GE, continued to be profitable, even as they faced increased competition from Japan, from Germany. But look at where those profits went. They started going to investors, to big shareholders, to executives, to share buybacks and dividends. And workers got a smaller and smaller piece of the pie. So yes, things were going to change. Yes, things were going to be more competitive. But it was a series of choices about how they responded that got us to the world we live in today. Man, I really just love that answer because I think it, I think it gets to, it threads the needle between what I was saying where, but look, like there are these bigger factors at play that has to be acknowledged, but the point of politics, leadership systems that you face choices. And the key thing is that when you talked about this this story post-81, you didn't just focus on CEOs though. You focused on government, you focused on shareholders. What choices did they or did they not make in the face of this global competition? So we just hit CEOs like Jack Welch. What did the other and the word stakeholder has a specific like, connotation today, but let's just say like generically, what did the other interest, interested parties is a better way to put this? What, and unions, okay, unions too is another union leadership. What choices did they make in the 80s that were good, bad, or just absent? Let's not forget, else, let, let's not forget who else took power in 1981. Ronald Reagan took the White House that year. And Reagan, President Reagan systematically spilled his administration with people sympathetic to Wall Street. And at the very moment Jack takes over GE, we start to get an administration that is loosening regulations on Wall Street, that is providing cover in the changes to the way the SEC operates for a new wave of dividends and buybacks. And it's Reagan, not Welch initially, who goes to war with the unions, with the air traffic controllers. And so not only was Welch providing cover for all the CEOs below him, but President Reagan in the White House was providing cover for a wholesale refashioning of how the business world was engaging with the social contract from the White House itself. So that, you know, I think it's important to remember this starts at the top. Welch was the one who did it in the corporate world, but even above him, President Reagan was encouraging, enabling some of these really ruthless decisions from the White House itself. That's so, the government, and we can go down from there. Yeah, and, and something that I want to capture here, because this is very well captured in, in, in the book, is it's not merely that Jack Welch was a powerful CEO. There are lots of powerful CEOs. There are lots of captains of industry, as, as you and historians put it. But there was something unique about his celebrity and his position within American life that also fueled. So for example, there is a there's a version of Jack Welch where he's just like a boring corporate executive type. He makes some changes and maybe that impacts the economy, right? The first person who created like mortgage-backed securities, that person also impacted, but that person isn't famous. Jack Welch is famous. Why did 
why and how did Jack Welch create this bigger persona that really played a role in spreading these ideas um, deeply? I, I want to be, I want us to be careful with our verbs and our nouns because you just said how Jack Welch created it. I think it's important to acknowledge he had a whole team of enablers that went from his PR team to the media to academia. So I want to, you know, he encouraged it, he welcomed it, but he couldn't do it alone. It took the whole of society to go along for this ride. And so how did he do it? Why did he do it? Why was he the guy? A number of reasons. Again, GE was for the longest time, the most influential company. That, that cultural capital, that authority that he had was enormous and impossible to overstate. You know, this was, it was the equivalent of being the CEO of Apple or Amazon today. This was the most important company of its age. And so all of a sudden, you know, it was already going to have some eyeballs. It was already going to have some attention. What I think is remarkable is that he overcame an initial negative wave of publicity in his early years, because not everyone, you know, went along with those mass layoffs I described. You know, he was called Neutron Jack just a couple of years after he took over. And yet somehow he got through Can you that. explain, it's, this is interesting, like little fun fact, can you explain what, 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 neutron, what Neutron means? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So those, and maybe we'll just slow down the narrative here and we can sort of chart his evolution of, of the, the evolution of his public persona. Uh, initially, after those first couple of years of mass layoffs, of factory closures, the first burst of offshoring where he sends factories overseas, the media dubs him Neutron Jack. And it's a reference to the neutron bomb, which purportedly kills people while leaving the buildings intact. And the idea was that all the workers were gone, but the factories were still standing. And there was a negative piece on 60 Minutes. And there was real hard look at, wait, a recognition by the media, by the general public, like, wait, this is not how business has operated for the last 40 years. Like, who is this guy and why is he firing people by the tens of thousands? And there was some real discomfort by, with it. But he weathers it. And he continues to have GE's board's support. And within a few years after that, listen, he gets the stock price ticking up. And after years during which the GE stock price and the markets at large had sort of been stagnant, we had that stagflation, all of a sudden the stock price is running up and people get pretty darn excited about that, right? People feel good when their stock portfolios are ticking up, when their 401ks are getting better. And it gives him the wind in his sails to continue on and have this unprecedented 20-year run as CEO. So then we get to the moment by the late 80s and then throughout the 90s where he goes from being vilified as Neutron Jack to celebrated. And his face appears on every business magazine cover. He starts sitting for in-depth interviews with Harvard Business Review to expound on his management philosophies. And he really becomes revered as sort of a, a CEO poet philosopher. Mm. There's a study that was done by some academics that actually looked at the verbiage that was used to describe him. And they found that in article after article, people described Jack in heroic terms with almost universally fawning language. And all of this culminates at the point of his retirement when Fortune magazine crowns him manager of the century, bestowing in like the ultimate capitalist honorific. But so, you know, Jack cultivated that, but a whole lot of other people made those things happen. You know, it's interesting. I, I really like the way the book starts because it, it, it asks this question, which I think everyone is going to have their own individual answer to, which is mm -hmm. the type of figures or ideas or, or individuals that a society elevates says something about the society. You give the example of pharaohs, you give the, you know, there's the obvious example of like Rome has the gladiator. You are saying that today we have the CEO. My answer to this question, I'd love to hear your reflection on and give like your answer is, my defense of the CEO veneration, and, and we'll of course talk about the role that the press plays in this, but I, I think my my explaining for um, you know people like yourself is that in a society where basically like institutions 
essentially don't work. And because institutions don't work, individuals in those institutions literally can't do anything. Um, so what I mean by that is it's hard to be a heroic senator when you literally cannot pass bills for good or for ill. It's hard to be a heroic president when society doesn't have the ability to agree to like a bit like JFK could be a hero because he says, let's go to the moon. Today, there are a couple of like complicated reasons why that doesn't work the same way. But you know, look, Elon Musk, like there's a million other Elon things. Let's 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 stick to let's stick to core Ashley Vance 2015 Elon Musk, right? Just <laughs> Elon Classic, the very, the very like, uncontroversial version. The, the obvious point here is look, like this is a guy who can say to himself, I want to do things. And then like we could quibble, well, did he start Tesla? Well, did he technically, no, that's not, that's not the core narrative here. The point is this isn't, JFK didn't invent the Saturn rocket. The point is he said like, this is the thing we're going to do. So in our era, CEOs can say, I want to do something. And directionally, there's something to that. And because there are no other alternatives, it's all we're basically left with, because I think as a society, we want to have things we could aspire towards. So I, I think that's my defense of the CEO veneration. It, it's really just, it's, it's more about, I would be more concerned about it if there were JFKs or LBJs or MLKs, not that there aren't civil rights leaders, but MLK could do civil rights move, Mike, organizing and leads to something big and transformational. So how, how do you just think about this, about this part of it? I love this conversation. I think you're spot on uh, on a lot of that. I would ask one question and make one distinction, if I may. The question I would ask is, you know, are there not more MLKs because we're not focusing on them? Because that's not right. It's like it's a chicken and the egg question, right? When we spend our time, when we spend our energy venerating capitalists and venerating CEOs, that's all time and energy that we don't spend lifting up the stories of social justice workers, of righteous religious leaders. They're out there, but they're just not getting the attention from the media, from the public, from social media. So the, we just need to understand you know, where is the cause and where is the effect. The distinction, and we, I, we can have that conversation. The distinction I wanna make is between entrepreneurs and builders and innovators like Elon Musk, like Jeff Bezos, complex and flawed as they may be, and between them and professional managers. Jack mm -hmm. Welch never invented anything in his life. He was a paid manager. He was paid to manage this company. And he was ultimately rewarded with something on the order of a billion dollars. He was among the first, certainly not the last. And I definitely understand the impulse to revere and celebrate true innovators. The fact that that has gotten us to the place where we hold up people managers on the same pedestal, I think is cause for real reflection and concern in my estimation. Okay. So that's really interesting because it brings to mind like an obvious, an obvious bit of pushback, not, not towards you, but just towards this broader dynamic, yeah. you just basically said people managers versus like innovators. And I think at this point in the game, everyone just sort of nods and hears that. But look, like what is, what is the 20th century, if not the early aughts, uh, but the age of the manager, management as science? You know, if I were recording this with you in the like 2000s, I could say like, are you, are you kidding me, David? Like there's all these Harvard studies, business is not just merely, you're just, you're just acting as if like Jack Welch is like Michael Scott, just running around like bumbling. Actually, what Jack, Jack Welch has innovated when it comes to managing people and tasks and these massive institutions, like GE isn't merely a, a office it's a multinational corporation, if not a country in of itself. Look at the, 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 the sheer amount of economic power it has. So why are you so disparaging in a way that I don't think we would have normalized up until basically the post-financial crisis era? Why are you so disparaging of management science? HBS told me it works, and you seem very skeptical. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying it's not a real innovation. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm questioning whether those are the people we want to be our heroes. I'm questioning whether 
it is someone who has perfected management science that we want our children to aspire to emulate. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, it's important when you're running a 100,000, 300,000 person corporation to understand good workflow and great org charts and good delegation practices. But when we think about how people remember our society in this moment, is that what we want them to remember? And I hope the answer is no. I hope we are able to lift up people who are doing work to elevate those among us who need help, that we are able to celebrate our artists and our great creators, and that also we do remember the great innovation that was happening, including from people like Elon Musk. You know, I'm curious, what does it, what does it say, do you think, about business culture slash, honestly, airport, airport books culture? that Jack's very specific framing of like management and just like take charge leadership was kind of the thing. Cause I think now the trend is very much uh, atomic habits, lots mm-hmm. of like productivity stuff. I, I think that's like the big, you know, like unfuck yourself. Like, the, like the, the, that's like the thing versus in the two thousands, like, and it's, it's kind of funny. Like if, if you were to, and I, th- I think they're going to do this at some point, they're, they're talking about this when, when NBC redoes the office, whether or not that works or not, you would most, you'd be much more likely to put atomic habits on Michael Scott's bookshelf and you'd have him be like a very cringe, like over optimizer of his productivity stuff instead of putting a Jack Welch, separate from like whether or not Jack Welch is the fact, you know, he's, he's passed away. Like he's, he's, he was older. So it's not relevant, but, but I still feel like we're, we're looking for a different message. Why were the two thousands and the 1990s so interested in like management in the way we're describing it? I'm, I'm thinking through this. I, I, I have not unpacked the answer to that question in a, in a, in a deep way. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm processing it. I, I concur with your conclusion. I'm almost going to work backwards. And I think, I don't know if you said it directly this way, but, but I think the, it was, I, was, I intuited it in the question, which is that the atomic habits, this focus on productivity, this, this search for self-optimization is a response and a reaction to that management culture that thrived during the 90s and early aughts. And so I'm just sort of working backwards. So if if atomic habits and cell productivity uh, is a response to that management, what was the rise? What do we attribute that rise of management culture to? Um, and I, I'm, I'm working with it. I don't, I don't have a perfect well, I mean, the answer here. Well, I, well, what, as you're, you, yeah. Well, as you're, I, well, as you're, no, no, it's helpful because as you're saying this, what I'm basically thinking about is like, look, like this kind of goes to your point, which is most, okay, this is good. You know, my peers, this listenership do not think of themselves. Like we have a decently educated audience um, as budding managers Right. Like you're like it, the reason, the reason why Michael Scott had the book, right. And the reason why like Trump had and why Trump books were also big in this era too. Like Trump did a more down market version, not even down market because they're like audiences were similar, but he did a more in your face version of, of the Jack Welch book. But it required that you think of yourself as a person like on this path up the corporate ladder. So, Hey, yeah. you may just be a like, you know, think of like, you know, I think of someone like, um, uh, man, st- st- Steve, the guy, the guy, the guy who was the CEO of AOL, um, Steve, Steve case, Steve case. like Steve, Steve case. Um, I'm, a, I'm a weird, a- I'm obsessed with AOL history for no good reason. I read like three books on AOL <laughs> during the lockdowns. Um, but Steve case, like when he started, you know, he, he becomes the CEO of AOL time Warner merger, biggest business disaster in, in world history. But, you know, he started as a, he worked at, um, I can't forget, what, whoever owned Pizza Hut, like his job as a 22-year-old out of Williams College, would he would go and taste the different pizza, um, pizza and pasta flavorings in Pizza Huts. So if you're him, right, you're, you're ambitious, you're smart, you see a Jack Welch book at that airport as you're living this hellish traveling like, life, you're like, you know what, like someday I'm going to be like 
a manager. I'm going to be CEO. I don't think people today see themselves that way. And I think that's kind of like, no. it's kind of sad. And I, I think that's like the critical difference. And the point of the self-optimization thing is it's, it's inward. It's, in, it's very inward focused. Not, I'm not saying that disparagingly, but it's just kind of this assumption that, oh, like all this is kind of about you. Right. Uh, first, I just, I've never heard that anecdote about Steve Case. And I love the notion of Steve Case as a Pizza Hut sommelier. Like, he hated just, it. He, he it was terrible. He, this perfect. is part of his, this is part of his story, you know, like. <laughs> but, but, but then to bring that back to the airport, it, somewhere on this infinity loop of uh, the rise of the corporation, the, also this was, I think we can't forget the moment when many of these companies really became multinational corporations. And by, by nature of their expansion and their growth, the complexity of the way they operated was, was sort of increasing exponentially. And so there was this whole flourishing of management culture. And I, I think, again, like that fed into the loop. And here we're, again, it's sort of the cause effect debate, right? So was, what, were people sort of celebrating and pursuing management content uh, because they were living in an age of, of increasingly complex, large multinational corporations? Or, or, or was it the other way around, right? Were, were those corporations and the growth sort of inspiring the rise of that. I think it's all connected, but the, the uh, just lastly on this point, I think the rise and success of tech entrepreneurs over the last 20 years has set the precedent, has set the groundwork, laid the groundwork. And maybe here is some of the insight. Um, it was the rise of big companies that I think really defined mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s. And it's been the rise of startups that has defined the last 20 years of our economy, you could argue. And there, I think we can see the parallels in how individuals are relating to their corporations and what kind of leaders they want to uh, emulate and, and, and model. And it's, it's in the entrepreneurs that you see the atomic habits come out, whereas it was in the Jack Welch's of the 80s and 90s that you see a more traditional HBR fair. And and this is this basically gets us back to the timeline here because we we basically left off in 2001 to basically the financial crisis where once again manager of the century um, all of the books once again like the Michael Scott reference the the 30 Rock cameo and I think 2007 2008 what happens to GE like why why are we talking in the past tense about all of this and I, and I think once again I think I think the most important point here is that you know, the genre of, of book you're writing, like sometimes this is all kind of like, it's easy to dunk on Mark Zuckerberg pre like metaverse pivot, but like it works. Uh, <laughs> there is cringe there, but it works. But the key thing about all the things you're describing here, the, the m a the deunionization, the, exe the executive co um, compensation, it actually doesn't work and leads to disaster. So describe that process to us. It doesn't work in the long term, and it did work in the short term. And and this notion of time horizons is so critical, uh, and and something I think we need to keep in mind because Jack did make GE the biggest, most valuable company in the world. But then, as you say, almost immediately after he retires, it starts falling apart. Now, a number of things led to that. Jack's last day on the job was September eight, two thousand one. Three days later, the world changes with the terrorist attacks. His chosen successor, Jeff Immelt, is left to clean up an enormous mess, right? Lots of GE's industrial businesses were suddenly in the tank. The financial markets, which GE had expanded into, are buffeted on all sides. But it very quickly becomes clear, not only to Immelt, the new CEO of GE, but also to the Wall Street analyst community, that GE was not you know, quite the company so many thought it was, that in fact, Jack Welch and his team had been using GE Capital, this large black box of a financial institution, to essentially smooth out its earnings, to make its earnings look consistent, predictable, and to just keep hitting the targets that it had promised Wall Street. And thus begins the great unraveling of GE. 
was never able to recover its previous glory under Jack. And by 2016, Imelt leaves the company. And then just last year in 2021, the current CEO, Larry Culp, announces that GE is getting broken up once and for all. And, and something I'd like you to speak about now that we're in the present day is, could you just talk about just the role of the publicly facing CEO? Like, especially when we can look at it the lens of a company like Disney. Um, so Disney, you know, there's 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 Bob Iger, and I think but I I actually really like Bob Iger. His he actually whether or not he wrote the book or not, like his book was actually a very good, like very Ride of a Lifetime was actually a very 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 good um, businessman book. But it seems like he was just like the apex. He seems to be like the apex, like celebrity CEO, but re- but also real CEO. Because what I think he did a great job of is he balanced the celebrity. He's very he's very handsome. He works out at 4 a.m. every morning. Um, it's weird that I know all these details, but whatever. Um, and he also does the Disney, the, the Marvel acquisition, the Pixar acquisition, all these, all these different bits. You know, he wants to go and become ambassador to China. But that doesn't happen because Disney and various positions he hold are obviously intertwined in U.S.-China trade tensions. And then you have the current CEO of Disney, Bob Chapek, running into trouble in Florida with um, just... De- broader debates about like politics, culture wars, those those different bits. So it seems like the modern CEO has all of these sets of very specific challenges that are just like fundamentally different. So can you just and, and I want to get into like the, the the people like you said who are who are coming next and like who are spotlighting. But can you just like can you t- can you write the corner office column? So just talk about like what is the modern CEO just kind of facing? It, it's an unprecedented set of demands that are coming at CEOs. And it's no longer about just running a company. And in fact, sometimes for a lot of these men and the few women that run big public companies, that's really the least of it. They, as you say, need to contend with the culture wars, which are going to show up on their Twitter feeds and outside their buildings in the form of protesters. There's this increasing schism between big business and the Republican Party, which is, seems to be growing just about every week with um, one issue or another, uh, drawing CEOs into cultural and political debates and prompting fierce backlash from the right, who's telling CEOs to stay out of politics, as they say. Uh, Globalization is obviously here to stay and has gotten enormously complex between things like the war in Ukraine and the isolation, growing isolation of China, um, both, I think, strategically and um, you know, with their increasing pursuit of COVID zero and the implication that's having on supply chains. So the list goes on and on and on. And as you say, you know, what CEOs are now expected to do goes well beyond running the company. The thing that I would challenge in the assessment of Bob Iger as a, as a, as a great CEO, and I, I know he did amazing things for Disney as a corporation, is I would just encourage us to ask theme park workers if they thought, Bob Iger was a great CEO because the way in which Iger perpetuated the Jack Welch legacy of just fundamentally devaluing front, frontline workers, I think is important to keep in mind. And we've written stories about Disney theme park workers living out of their cars. And when we have a corporation like Disney that is lush with profits, sending billions back to shareholders in the forms of dividends and buybacks, but they're still letting their theme park workers sleep in their cars. I I question whether we can really hold up someone who's running that company as an exemplary leader. And speaking of the political controversies, I'd love to get your thoughts on Brian Armstrong's mission-focused companies idea now that we're more than a year over it. So just to quickly introduce this for mm-hmm. guests, uh, basically, you know, a little over a year ago, or yeah, a little over a, over a year ago, Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase, basically wrote this blog slash memo where he was like, look, like we as a company are just going to stay focused on mission. We are a cryptocurrency, like trading platform it's not a proper explanation of what Coinbase is, but it's basically how you're going to use it as a user. And that's what we focus on. Like we're not political. We're not going to take stands. We're just going to focus on it. And at the time, 
there's a lot of blowback because I think also is the New York Times, like y'all were doing a lot of reporting on specific issues that like black workers at the company were having. So admittedly, it was it was a little it was a little tough to look at the claim he was making outside of the well, are you just saying this because you're self-interested? That said, something that I just keep noticing is all of these center left people over the past few months have increasingly been telling me. Uh, I think he was onto something and it doesn't feel as if like the status quo, especially going into 2024, especially when it's looking like there's going to be a second Trump run. It doesn't seem like the engage and culture issues is a going to be productive or B even be palliative. Like that's, that's the, the, the I think the most, and that will be because I'm monologuing here, but like, it's just like, I'm deeply sympathetic to Bob Chapek because, and I don't think a lot of people understand this, Disney is both all powerful, but also like not powerful at all. Disney could do whatever it wants. It's not going to change any law that is passed in Florida. And actually, funnily enough, and I study the the right in the Republican Party, so I know this. If you're Ron DeSantis, you actually probably want Disney to aggressively come out against you. I had all these people on my Twitter, you know, big blue check accounts saying like, okay, Disney, put your money where your mouth is. Donate to his opponent. I'm like, that is what Ron DeSantis 100% wants. And I guarantee you a small dollar donations alone, he would probably match whatever is happening because there's a whole part of the right, which is activated against companies in that way. So how do you just think about like this broad, whether it's like the mission focus part or like the challenges facing, it's just like, it's actually kind of like a game theory, like strategy level kind of like, and look, this is people's lives here. So I don't want to seem like demeaning and like, it's just like a game, but it's just sort of like, man, if you're a CEO, I do not know. It seems like mission focused, maybe just increasingly winning out at least rhetorically, because it seems like the only way out. It's kind of like the war games. The only way to win is to not play a bit. No doubt. CEOs are caught in the middle. You make one decision, you're going to piss off the right, make another decision on these cultural hot button, cultural war issues, you're going to piss off of that. So I fully understand the impulse. And indeed, like no one asked CEOs to be our new philosophers, right? Like who who bestowed Bob Chapek with any moral authority? I'm sorry, but like this gets back to the earlier part of the conversation. Like, why are we listening to CEOs as like our heroes and the people who are going to tell us how we should navigate issues like abortion and gun rights and immigration, right? Like that's not their job. So I fully understand that impulse by CEOs and by observers like us to say, like, get out of here. I stop caring about these. Stop weighing in on every last issue. But the question they have to ask, and what I hear from CEOs as I talk to them, is can they get away with that? Because Mm -hmm. it's their employees and their customers at some point, but largely their employees who are demanding that they take a stand on these issues, who are bombarding their inboxes with questions. Why haven't you said anything about Black Lives Matter? You know, use the power of this company, its stature, its reach, its economic muscle to take stands on these issues. And so I just talked to, I talked to Mark Benioff for a piece that it's going to run in a day or two, maybe uh, will have run by the time this podcast airs, where he, again, he was one of the first CEOs to really start going hard on some of these issues, threatening to pull his business out of Indiana, its second largest state uh, for employment. If in 2015, I believe it was, the state went ahead and started enforcing a, a, a bill that allowed businesses to discriminate against LGBTQ plus individuals. And so he said, no, we're not going to do it. But he didn't do that only because that might be where his personal morals are, where his personal values are. He did it because he's like, my employees are going to work for me if I don't stand up for them. And so CEOs like Benioff and others really view their engagement with these issues as a proxy for their own employees. And that's where it's so hard for them because they can't ignore their employees. And to the extent the customers get involved as well, uh, that's a factor too. But a lot of this is trying to navigate a workforce that has new expectations about the role of business in society. How much, uh, because the key thing about Brian Armstrong's mission focused memo is he specifically is like, if you don't like this, you can leave. So, you know, Mm -hmm. buyouts and those bits. I'm wondering how you think the economic picture 
and a problem in a possible recession changes these dynamics. Because like you said, during the weird, especially white collar, you work at a big tech company or fortune 500 post COVID lockdown boom, this weird, we don't have like a proper name for this weird period that basically ended yeah. with the layoff six weeks ago, but that's, that's the period. Why? And this is why, and this is why I'm, help, I'm so glad that you brought up the, the, the frontline workers there. We, we're, we're, this is a very like specific, very white privileged folks. This is sure. not the Amazon warehouse worker. This is not the theme park park. This is you work at a big tech company or a fortune 500. You've had maximal power. Okay. I'm just going to piece. Um, if you, but I, I don't feel like that's the same. It's not the same. It doesn't feel the same way right, right, right now in terms of like, oh, like there are massive layoffs and there could be a recession. I'm not sure employees are going to have the same amount of power that they've had up until now. But how, how do you, how do you think about how, 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 so this is good. How much is this like a pure, like my millennial and then the Gen Z generation below me have changed their view of how businesses work versus during pure like times that like are stunted towards the employee, employees are going to like reach for things in a way that employees probably always, always have. I, I think a lot of these forces that we've been talking about in this conversation, I mean, the pendulum swings over the period of many years and decades and generations even. And I think what we've seen is the pendulum was swinging one way. Really, you could argue starting in 1971 when Milton Friedman wrote his essay in the New York Times Magazine saying that the purpose of a business is to increase its profits, right? And from that moment, it was 10 years before someone like Jack started putting those words into action. And then for 20 years, he reshaped GE and reshaped the expectations of what a CEO is supposed to do and how a company is supposed to comport itself. And for the last 20 years after that, we've been living in that legacy. I think what we're starting to experience right now with the rise of employee engagement that you just talked about, with the rise of stakeholder capitalism and things like the business roundtable, redefinition of the purpose of a corporation in 2019, is the pendulum start to swing back in the other direction. And I think it in the same way that it was a generational project to see the rise of shareholder primacy, it's going to be a generational project and it's going to be in fits and starts. And it's going to be messy and it's going to be hard and there's going to be obstacles, but it's going to take decades for the pendulum to move back in the other direction. And I think this employee engagement we're seeing is a part of that. And one of the early manifestations that we're seeing as, as workers as executives, as investors, try to understand what is the proper role of a business in society, right? Is, it, it, I, I, is there consensus that, yeah, we ought to be doing more for the economic livelihoods of our workers? Maybe. Maybe we're getting somewhere closer to that, you could argue. But is it too far for a company to be taking a stance on really controversial, complex issues like abortion rights, right? These are the conversations we're having right now. And we're having them at a moment, as you said, back to this very first point you made, where we don't have unified public leadership from politicians, where we don't have a religious leader, a monarch, right? In America, we're left with our business leaders. They are our last great unifying cultural forces and so that's part of the reason why so much is asked of them. And, and yet, one, and one thing I'll yeah, add to please. it, it's, it's not just that, because this is the key, this is the key awkward part of the dynamic. It's not just that they're like one of the last remaining unifying figures. Cause like, you know, Queen Elizabeth, you know, is a, is a, is a monarch, but she has no power. They have power. If you are a CEO, you can actually do things. Whether or not Elon actually acquires Twitter, Elon could, because whole other whole other conversation, Elon really could say, I have a different conception of what speech is on the internet. I'm going to purchase Twitter and do something about it. There are no 
and, and it's a weird combination of like, A, like there are obviously a constitutional limits on governmental power, but there's also just like when a society is low trust as we have the one right now, it's harder to do a big unifying project like the Hoover Dam if you're FDR or going to the moon um, if you're JFK or just the great society if you're LBJ. So I, I, I think that's uh, I think that's the way I'll sum it up. So, um, you know, David, I think there's, I, I think the thing this conversation captured for me most is that it's not. Because I don't know, like, if you're going to see, you, you see a title like how Jack, you know, putting Jack Welch on this cover, it's like a, it's a bold, it's a bold statement, right? How much can any one figure represent something? But I think the thing you've captured the most here and in the in the book too is this idea that we really can chart these conversations by before, during, and after. Um, if, when we're debating all three of these different um, big points, which we're not going to come to a perfect answer on here, but really matter. So I just want to say a huge thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. The book is The Man Who Broke Capitalism. And I'm so grateful. It was fantastic.